and we're live. We are live. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to a new episode of Brad Bad for Your Health Entertainment. I'm Tom, joined by my main man, Godzilla. And ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are joined by legendary Daredevil comic book writer Dan Chichester. How are you tonight, Dan? I'm great, Tom. Donzilla, Matt, <laughs> it's great to see yep. both you guys. Um, great to be on board. Thank you for the chance yep. to, to talk to with you. you. Glad to have you. Thanks again for coming on. Yeah. Uh, Dan, we'll just get right into it. What were some of the things when you were a younger man that influenced you? Were you always the younger guy that just knew you wanted to be a writer? Were you always, always that good with words? When did you figure it out? And what were certain, some of the inspirations that sort of drove to your style of writing? <laughs> like, what great, were you into? That's a great question. And I don't know if anybody's ever asked me that before. Um, and which is weird. I, I was <laughs> always into, um, I mean, I was into comics up to a, a, a point, you know, probably about 13, 14, seriously into comics, you know, I'd ride the bike across heavy traffic, go pick up the comics, bring them back, strapped to the back of the bike. Maybe some flew away, <laughs> you know, if I didn't have them strapped down right. Um, collected them you know, in, in just the dresser drawers in my in my room. Uh, God knows where the clothes were. They weren't there because the comics were all in there. Um, <laughs> and I read them and loved them and loved them as stories and characters. And never, never in my wildest dreams did I ever think about writing for comics. Um, what I wanted to write was, was horror stories. I mean, I was a big horror fan. I, you know, I watched horror movies. A monster week on on the 430 movie which you know was like a, a kind of a afternoon you know retro uh, movie uh, show on one of the, the local stations like I a matinee that. matinee yeah like they'd have different weeks you know they'd have a spy week they'd have a comedy week they'd have marx brothers week and they'd have monster week and they would just show like these movies at 4 30 you know and and badly edited but i didn't um but you know that was my my big drive, and I got I got introduced to to Stephen King at a at a way too early age. You know, some uh, a college age friend of my mother's like hands me The Shining, and he's like, "Oh, you might want you might like this." You don't hand The Shining to a you know, <laughs> a kid; it just isn't right. Um, but I I had that that bug, and that was the type of thing that I really thought I wanted to to write. I mean, those were my heavy influences: science fiction. Um, uh, hard science fiction, really, probably more than than you know, soft space opera stuff. And I just loved, I just loved words. I loved losing myself in stories. Books were my best friends. You know, these were my my uh, the place I I I dive into. Some fantasy. You know, I got I got introduced to the uh, Tolkien, Lord of the Rings. You know, stuff probably around. I want to say fifth or, or sixth grade, you know, in school. And that became, you know, like a whole thing. And where did that, that lead me not too deep into other fantasy realms, but, but similar adventures in that way. And there was just a sense that I want to create these type of, of, of worlds, you know, uh, not, not really in a practically planned way, but I just felt intuitively, this is what I wanted to do. And I think probably the way it, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tom. I'm I'll babble well, on. Like, what was it about horror and those things that, that intrigued you? Was it the setting or was it like the characters? Like, what was there certain things about the writing that you gravitated towards? Was it like a strong character or like these settings that, like, say, King or Tolkien had had I, I built think, the world they I, built? I think early on it was probably more plot driven. You know, I, I think the the sense of like these incidents happening, right? You know, matter teleporters or horror movies like The Fly, which is really not a great movie if you watch it again. But at the time that you first see it when you're a kid, I mean, the new Fly is 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 its own thing. But right. but you know, the the early one is a lot of cheese whiz. Um, but but the whole yeah, exactly. But the whole concept <laughs> is is pretty wild, right? You know, it's just yes. this guy built this thing and something went wrong, and now he's melded into this this insect. The insects melded into him. Those type of things are just, you know, they're springboards. I want to tell a story like that, and mm -hmm. of course, the first time you tell stories like that is you basically repeat them. You know, everybody who's into that world or worlds like that, you know, writes their crappy H.P. Lovecraft story. You know, you know, there's something awful is happening out there in the night. It's so frightening. It's indescribable. Um, but those 
just felt creepy and it, the creepiness was intriguing and definitely i blame my parents in this because uh, halloween was a was the family holiday you know i have pictures of one of my my you know uh, screen right now is my uh, desktop you know pattern it's my mom and 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 father you know dressed as basically a, a witch and a warlock you know holding us kids over like a cauldron this was like the way we were brought up so when you're brought up in that kind of environment and world this stuff is is both uh normal <laughs> and something that you you then look for for ways to to play out your own ideas in you know, you'd mentioned The Fly, and I don't know why this popped into my head, but that's one of those movies on my list that I got to watch again soon because it's been <laughs> the original or the or the Cronenberg one. The original, the Cronenberg is almost that's almost a flawless picture, but it really the, is. The original <laughs> is so bad; it's good. I love The Fly. <laughs> it is. It's got a it's got a quaint strangeness to it, and of course, it has Vincent Price. You know, so anything with Vincent Price was. I'm a sucker for those '50s cheese. I mean, one movie oh, yeah. that I got really into was the mole people but because oh. it's one of those so i would love to tell a story like that like you just said there's an earnestness to them too yes that there's really an like honestness and earnestness yeah. and i love i love those movies to death i'm glad that some of those inspired that some of those you took when class, you were younger definitely. so what definitely. how did you end up getting into comics then because you said you had no conception of ever getting into it Never. was daredevil Never. on your buy list Back no, in the day on the newsstands. No. I mean, I was I was a big DC fan, and you know, I often wonder is it just because I was too shallow and it was my initials, or or I was just too <laughs> shallow and you know their stories were a little more shallow. I mean, I I, I don't know I mean, the D, the Marvel stuff never really clicked with me, and maybe because this was where I was at the time too. Because uh, as I said, I was probably more plot driven. I think a lot of DC stuff may have been more plot driven in a certain way. And so I would fall in love with, with uh, Mike Grell's warlock, uh, warlord. You know those type of things. You know these you know, this fantastic, uh, you know, idea of this guy who falls into this, you know, alternate world of, of, of sword and you know fantasy. You know, sort of, sort of fighting. That was a big favorite of mine. Um, you know, I loved Green Lantern. I mean, and, but Green Lantern is very, at least at that point, probably a much more plot driven, you know, type of environment. This guy's got this ring. He can do anything. Um, what's going to happen with this. Um, so, but these were just um, uh, things I enjoyed. And then I stopped enjoying them. Not consciously. It's not like I sort of fell out of them, but I just stopped reading them. You know, I can, I can almost like to a, to a date, if I go back and look at those comics, say this was the month I stopped writing that bike and getting those comics and um, didn't think about them again until I was in film school. And film school was, um, you know, even something I hadn't really thought about. Uh, but I had been telling types of stories. I've been making sort of films in, 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 in high school for different reasons. And uh, one guy sort of said to me, a friend of mine was, was like, well, you're going to film school, right? <laughs> this was how carefully planned my life was. You, you know, and to me, it was like, oh, that's, that's an interesting thing I never really thought about. In film school, in NYU film school, um, they give you maybe 400 feet of film to make your, your films, which is not a lot of film, right? No, Video it's not. Or, you know, right. On the phone now, it doesn't matter. Go for hours. 400 feet of film doesn't do much good for anything. No. So um, you run through that really quickly. And I was ambitious and I wanted to make my, my student film, made it, ran out of money. Um, and I said, well, I better finally go to the student work office, the student employment office. So they had, you know, different things up on the wall, do this, do that. The, the other thing, typist at Marvel Comics. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, wow, wow, I type really fast. Um, and if you're going to type somewhere, well, geez, Marvel Comics sounds like a pretty good place to, to type at, right? Um, so I go in and, and it's Marvel Comics. And all the things that I had read and knew, because even though I wasn't a big Marvel fan, I, of course, still knew the characters. I knew who Cap was, and I knew who Iron Man was, and I knew what their backstory was. So I go in and I interview for this position, which is with the foreign licensing department, and um, and they're like, "Hey, you seem like you've got a good head on your shoulders." And yes, you do type fast, but we just gave this job away. <laughs> so so I'm like, "Oh, okay, well, wah wah." Um, 
But they said, why don't you go downstairs and talk to Lynn Cohen, who is the assistant to the editor in chief and Lynn needs an assistant. So it was the assistant to the assistant to <laughs> the editor in chief. And uh, I went down, talked to Lynn and, and she uh, either liked what I had to, to bring or she just desperately needed somebody probably somewhere in between the two. And, uh, <laughs> and so I got a part-time job because I was still in school. Right. But so this was a part-time when you're finished with, with classes gig at Marvel doing pretty much anything that either the editor in chief needed or that Lynn needed. Which That's going to be pretty cool though. It was very cool. I mean, I'm not to, to, to recognize it at that point in my life. Um, not fully, right? You know, I, I probably didn't recognize how cool it was until later. Maybe this very conversation, but uh, <laughs> but but there were a lot. You know, it's just surreal, right? Suddenly, you're in Marvel Comics. You're 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 surrounded by people who are creating these these stories, and you're fielding requests um, by the editor in chief, who at that point was was Jim Shooter, who was a larger than life character. Um, I've heard. In in addition to to physically like larger in life, you know, it's like you know six, seven, six, eight, um, and and also just you know big in personality, big in what he was creating. Um, so it was it was a crazy uh, moment in time to just suddenly have all this stuff flood back into you, and then um, and then say, well, where does this go for me? What do I do with this? Because my goal was still filmmaking right i'm going to graduate i'm going to go to california i'm going to make movies so even being there wasn't necessarily you know naturally me saying oh i'm going to start writing comics because i'm here it was just this is if you're going to if you're going to have a gig for a, a, a job while you're in school you can go you can do a lot worse than this but during that time when you said you were the assistant to the assistant editor-in-chief you you were there watching this did they have the teams yet, like the war rooms, like the mutant team and the Spidey team, and not so much. I mean, those would come a little bit later. Um, yeah, you know, this was there. There were there were editorial offices, right? There yes. was the Spider-Man editorial office. Yep. There was the X-Men editorial office. Yeah, that's what that's what I was referring to. I just but, they, but not so much the the um, you know. And I was part of a little bit of this when I was working on the like the Midnight Suns horror books, where they used to then bring together bigger war rooms or even off-site, um, you know, get-togethers of a lot of the, the creative teams to sort of plan out what's going to happen, you know, across all the X-Books. Yeah. Those would start to come, uh, you know, to life probably toward the end of the, the end of the 80s, the early 90s, you know, when those kicked in a lot more. Of course, those more of those mutant war rooms had to be almost hotel floors. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those were, those were big, big meetings with lots of, you know, big folks. And, and, you know, as as the numbers picked up, you know, in terms of sales, as the stories got more complex, um, uh, a lot more had to be coordinated, you know, across those. So you said you, you your plan was to graduate film school, go to California, make <laughs> reanimator or something of that sort. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I could hit that, that would be pretty nice mark. Yeah. Yeah. But how did you end up staying at Marvel, if I may ask? Um, well, you, you know, you 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 sort of graduate up, uh, you know, from one thing to the next and, and you start to realize, uh, uh, am I enjoying certain aspects of this? What is this affording me in terms of storytelling opportunity or career opportunity? So I start as the assistant to the assistant to the editor in chief. Um, then I'm an assistant editor or I'm an, I'm a, yeah, I'm an assistant editor. Um, with the Epic Comics division, which was their yep. creator-owned division. You know, uh, people actually own the properties they created for the most part. And we were doing a lot more higher-end publications. You know, these were these were a lot of illustrated or painted, you know, comics. So the production quality was different. So I had to learn new skills, you know, doing that and working with people who were telling stories outside of the Marvel world, but still very cool stories, but their own stories. So that was a great learning process. Then somebody leaves and now I'm an editor, right? You know, now I have a chance to be an editor. So, you, you know, you start to, you know, push back that California thing because you're, you're doing work that you're enjoying and it's opening, you know, new doors. 
And ultimately, I get sick of the editor stuff, and I say, well, I'm just going to go write. <laughs> I'm going to get back. Is that, to is that how? Is that how it literally was? Pretty much. I mean, there there was a point in time where where uh, there had been some big editorial shifts. Um, some things had moved around. Archie Goodwin, who was um, uh, the leader of the Epic Division and, and kind of a mentor um, in terms of um, what I was doing, uh, got uh, well. He chose to leave. Let's put it that way, and chose to go to DC Comics. Uh, and uh, and it sort of changed the dynamics of the Epic Comics group that I was part of. You know, I was part. We were part of Marvel. We were a part of one thing, but it changed. The folks who hadn't really been ingrained in, in Epic um, weren't as used to what we were doing and why we were doing it. So suddenly what was special about Epic kind of got folded into the rest of things. And it changed changed the feeling a little bit of, of what I was doing from an editorial point of view. Um, and so I decided, all right, I'm going to do this a little bit longer, which I did. But then I said, maybe it's time to just hang my own writing shingle out there and see if I can make a go of it as quote unquote, just a writer. And that was the decision. And literally I gave notice and I didn't have a, a book to my name. <laughs> I didn't have, I didn't have anything lined up. I, I didn't, wasn't the regular writer on this or that. I walked down the hall to my friend, uh, Greg Wright's office, and he was taking over some of the titles that I had been editing. And I, I basically auditioned to sign myself to one of the titles. <laughs> I said, well, if you don't have a writer for, for this, which was Nightbreed at that time, um, I said, I will, well, you know, I, I'll take it on. Now, Greg could have refused that. Greg Greg was not just going to give me a gig because he was my friend. He was, you know, he was looking for certain it things. It was an audition process. It was. He was he's, he's, Greg's a tough, he's a tough character. You're not going to just get something from him, you know, from nepotism or, oh, yeah, you're my pal. Throw this, throw this on here. So he was... Um, open, he said, yeah, you're, you're a logical choice. You know, these characters, you helped launch this book, you know, Clive Barker's, you know, world, um, get started. So then I had at least one uh, title to work on. And then I had to start thinking about, all right, how do I go after other ones and start to move from doing inventory issues, which is what I was probably doing up to that point, meaning fill in issues that writing for different editorial offices that might or might not run. West Coast starting, Avengers was one of them, if I recall. West Coast Avengers, yes, West Coast Avengers, giant ca catcher's mitts, and um, <laughs> and uh, 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 you know, small things like uh, what was it, Solo Avengers? You know, there's like eight page story in a Solo Avengers, which yep. Mark Grimwald helped, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, walk me through and was you know very giving and in, in advice. Mark um, Grimwald, still to this day, the best Captain America writer. That's right, oh, I said that. A phenomenal and a phenomenal guy, just an amazing, yeah. just an amazing editor, an amazing character. Um, but that was, that was it. You know, I just, I said, this is the time to try this. And, and it was, a, a you know, not a very considered move, <laughs> you know, in my head, but I think it was sometimes those little things that, that lead to opportunity. And it, and it certainly did at that point. So then after doing Nightbreed, which is a messed up movie, Clive Barker's, his writing is just. Oh, yeah. And that, that's coming back. Yeah. I hear there's a new Nightbreed series, actually. And I heard Pinhead's coming back, too. Is he? Oh, they're doing a new Hellraiser? I heard he's got the rights now. Yeah, I think probably the, the things have finally reverted to, to his his control. Yeah. But he was great to work with. I mean, he was a phenomenal, like, just. Here's, here's, here's what I think about my characters. Go play with them. Go make them weirder. You know, go make them, you know, run. It's kind run of tough with to do that, though, isn't that, with Clive Barker's work? If he wants the thing a little more satanic or darker, it's just a little. Just... <laughs> he was he was he was one of the best people you could possibly work with, though. I mean, just to give you the keys to his world and say, go, go play. Um, it was it would be hard to imagine a better. Um, uh, I'm not going to say collaborator, but no, in some ways a collaborator, but but just permission permission to go play with this you know not not i'm not going to keep um you under my thumb here i'm going to tell you what i'm trying to trying to achieve with these characters and these worlds and i'm going to trust you to make something out of it i saw hellraiser when i was a kid <laughs> not like five but like you know maybe like 11 or 12. yeah and i was just sort of and there's some there's some there's some creepy yeah. shit in there there's some weird whacked out stuff in that movie 
Definitely. That whole world. I, I have to confess, I tuned out after the fourth one. I was just like, okay, they're in space. Yeah, they 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 definitely started to go progressively weirder. I think the yeah, first, say, the that first, was the worst one. <laughs> the, fourth, the space one. Did, they yeah. should have had a meet. Uh, wasn't there a Jason in the space? With one? that mutant a... dog thing that was chasing everyone around. I, I was I, just I, like, what the hell? I don't think <laughs> yeah. I've ever. And seen yes, that. there was a there was a Jason in space. So they should have met. Yeah. You know, you know, they should have. And Chucky, up. no, Pinhead. Um, but that had comedic value. Jason space. Jason, yeah, Jason X. That was like more of a comedy. It was just. Oh, this, <laughs> I checked out on that one too. All the oh, yeah, I, I, I checked out on Jason. Like, it was hilarious. <laughs> After he went to Manhattan, I was just sort of like, "Yeah, these are." <laughs> I'm like, I'm done. Manhattan's Michael, so Michael kind of stayed a course, but then when he became a reality show guy, I was just kind of like, Ugh. "Too much, too much." And then the Rob Zombie, I was just like, "Ugh." <laughs> <laughs> it took Jamie Lee coming back for me to come back. But that was not bad. That one was not bad. That was not a bad movie. Yeah, that was pretty good. A little cliche, but what you got to be. Exactly. Doesn't the next one come out this year? It was supposed to come out last year, but then the, the, the yeah, pandemic, yeah. obviously. Uh, so you go to the yeah. Jamie Lee one? All right. That, that one I might yeah. check out, too. Halloween Kills is oh, okay. the title. Okay. Yeah, that's, weird. that's a surprise. <laughs> And then there's going to be Halloween Ends coming out the next year because I guess they shot them simultaneously oh, yeah. or back to back, if you will. Okay, okay. Yeah. everything's got to be a trilogy. Yeah, always. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so you were doing the fill-in issues, but then how did Daredevil? Was Daredevil the first, like after Nightbreed, the first big Marvel title to come to your lap? No, that would have been Nick Fury. So like Nick, Nick Fury, Fury was, was the first. Was like you know the real kind of um, entry point probably into the into the. I mean, obviously, I knew the Marvel world and was working at Marvel, but in terms of writing a dedicated, uh, ongoing uh, uh, Marvel title based in the Marvel universe, that would have been the Nick Fury, you know, work. Um, which how was, was I was working on that Nick Fury. Those, those are those, some of those are good books. I, they were, they were, to me, they were ideal because in addition, you know, the other side of things growing up on horror stories on the one hand, James Bond on the other hand. So here you've got, you know, the, 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 the super spy espionage intrigue way of approaching things. And suddenly you're, you're in control of a character and, you know, the espionage arm of Marvel to some extent um, and getting to use this guy and all his toys and all his intrigue and play things out, which was uh, wonderful. And that was also a place where, you know, we get to play, we started to play games with things that I would then later play out in Daredevil to some extent and other titles where me and then Greg Wright again, because he was um, the editor on some of those, we started to turn the key on Hydra. We started to kind of use uh, these second characters that nobody wanted to use anymore. I mean, Hydra was a bit of a joke and it was sort of, you know, they run around in smocks and everyone was yeah. treating them. If I, if I need cannon fodder and I need to blow up some villains, we're going to bring Hydra in. Or we're not yeah. going to treat them like real villains, we're just going to bring it's them It's funny you say that, because that's one of the lines that you have in Tree of, I think it's Tree of Knowledge. Hydra's a joke. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's that's how it was treated by a lot of people. But we revitalized it. You know, we made them menacing, or tried to make them menacing. You know, we brought back uh, Baron von Strucker, and it's not important necessarily to bring back characters from the dead, uh, but he was a he was a great way to to be a lightning rod, you know, for them to represent um, uh, villainy and and force and 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 be them uh, have them have strength again. At least in the, story. the next generation, that's yeah. kind of what it was. Yeah, and and it's fun. It was fun to see the Marvel uh, movies, you know, use Hydra as a. A real villain you know for a good a good set of time you know now they've sort of gone to the back you know again and i give them credit for not just depending on one you know one villainous you know operation but uh it was cool to sort of see hydra getting their day in the sun <laughs> you know when those when those movies really started to take off i'll ask you about the marvel movies in a little bit but you had mentioned growing up with james bond i gotta ask who's your favorite goldfinger not even a, not even a, like goldfinger and, and connery that's like yeah. my high watermark. I mean, there's great bits in a lot of the other ones, but that movie hits all the right notes for me. See, Gadgets. my favorite Connery, my favorite Connery will always be from Russia with love. Oh, that is awesome too. Yeah. 
close second, but but I I I, I think Goldfinger balances um, uh, all the elements, you know, in, in in such a nice way. Goes a little bit over the top, um, and actually has a has a has an end of the world scheme that almost works. <laughs> You know? It does. It almost works. But I'll tell you which one I I still stand by uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. There's a lot of good stuff in that movie. And I don't There's think so Lazard is as film. bad as people make him out to be. Um, he was it was it was too different as a movie at that time. And I don't even think the filmmakers really stood behind it, you know, because it was so different. You know, it was marriage. radically different. It yeah. was almost it was almost 10 years ahead of the curve. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, really. I mean, that movie could fit right into the Daniel Craig, you know, slot. In fact, there's a lot of the Daniel Craig elements that are reflected in that movie or vice versa, as it, as it were. And there's also some of the Craigs that I also see a little bit of Timothy Dalton in there. In Honor Majesty's Secret Service? or uh, Like in, the Daniel Craig Bonds, I see a little bit of Timothy Dalton. Of Timothy Dalton, yeah. The yeah, late yeah. 80s, sort of that yeah. gruff, you know. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There was, there was yeah, if you're a big second. Bond fan, and you read the books, and you knew the whole story. There was a lot to admire about the Dalton stuff because you sort of felt like, oh my god, yeah, they're trying to draw from other aspects. Um, my my issue with the the Craig ones now is that they've gotten, I think they've gotten a little too serious. You, you know, they could use a little bit more of the fun, you know, to them. Is it? tricky thing to balance because then yeah because you because then you could end up like roger moore right and it starts to become a parody of itself yeah yeah which and, you know Moore did too too many in my opinion oh he was <laughs> continuing you know apparently he was a great guy and uh and i'm sure they they just enjoyed keeping him around you know for that but they also you know once once you have a, a hit film like austin powers that completely undermines <laughs> your you know what you're about you can't continue in that in that yeah. vote it's like uh you know weird al you know making a you know amish paradise is a parody of gangsta's paradise you know after that coolio's got no cred you know it doesn't Coolio uh, had no cred after that <laughs> <laughs> and, and i say that as a, big, as a big uh big weird al <laughs> Going, you know, it's funny going back to Bond for a second before I ask you another thing. You just that's how my mind works. I was convinced one of the Craig Bond movies was going to be called Ritico. Really? I, 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 had, I, I, honest to God, thought they were going to take that name and some of the plots from that book and, and make put that it a in Craig there. movie just because they never had used that title before. Yeah, I, I we will interesting to see if this other one ever makes it out. If um, and it will eventually, you know what it it will sets up and um and how it plays so you got to play with your the james bond in a sense with nick fury and then was it after nick fury other little titles or no then, then it, was, it was you know daredevil was the next big thing and and daredevil was one of those um you know moments in time that i i would never this is again sort of like the universe kind of pushes you into the right place at the right time and um i wouldn't have thought i was ready for like daredevil is a real character right not that nick yes. fury was but nick fury sort of like straddles reality and you know the bigger you know uh, costumed heroes you know sort of thing and um i said okay i'm doing good work on on shield you know this will lead to some other stuff um but i've got some more things to play out and learn <clears throat> but my friend um uh, steve bustolato who i mentioned before calls me um over thanksgiving and uh, and he says Anne's leaving the book. Anne Nascenti, who was on Daredevil, was leaving the Great book. Great run, an amazing run, and she's a wonderful Great person run. and a wonderful writer. And um, and I said, oh, that's that's crazy. Um, that's too bad. Who's taking over? And he says, you should. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm not, I'm not Daredevil quality. I'm not up there. <clears throat> and he says, well, Ralph, who is the editor, really likes your your work. Ralph um, Macchio, who was the, Ralph, the Ralph, editor yeah. on Daredevil at that point, really likes your work. He really loves what you're doing with Shield. You should definitely take a take a swing at it. And I'm like, man, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready for this. So I call up Ralph, or maybe I went into the office. I can't remember yeah. what. Um, and uh, and I probably went to the office. I, I was because I was in in New York City, and I, I probably poked my head in. And I was like, Ralph. Uh, 
I hear there's an opening on Daredevil. You're, you know, have you, have you, you know, decided who it is yet? And he's like, no, 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 I'm working on it. And uh, cause Anne wasn't leaving immediately. You know, there's obviously a little bit of a bridge and, um, and, uh, and I said, well, you know, would you mind if I put in a proposal for it? And, uh, and, uh, and he's like, oh no, no, you can go ahead and do it. And, but I, you know, it was that sort of thing. And Ralph's a great guy. He was a great editor. Um, but I could tell it was that sort of thing of like, yeah, sure. If you want to try, go ahead. <laughs> you know, I'll take anything. But there was no expectation it was going to be a, a thing, you know, or that I would I would win the day. You know, he was doing it, I think, out of courtesy because we were friendly and he liked the work that I was doing and other things. But I'm sure there was a and as I would later find out, you know, there was, you know, a list of, of a number of people who were putting in proposals at the same time. What um, was your what was your initial proposal for Daredevil? Well, it was it's it was it was based on two things really, and and one was make the character make the city a character, right? The city of New York should be a character to Daredevil. Like this, you know, there's so many neighborhoods, and I was living in New York at that time, so it was it was a great way to say that, and not just restrict him to Hell's Kitchen, but think about the city as a whole and what other neighborhoods could bring into that, and then the 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 second part of it and the thing that was the real probably heart of it was like we got to knock off wilson fisk i said how brilliant which is brilliant because and 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 how there you go there he is again he's on his knees um (laughs) that's a great image um and uh and um you know i said how many scenes can we have of daredevil going into that office and saying if you cross the line one more time fat man i'm going to take you down and then he would cross the line (laughs) <laughs> right. And then he'd go back and, and tell him, don't cross the line. Don't cross the line this time. You know, maybe. You and then Daredevil that. was fighting Blob and Pyro and, you know, Shotgun and yeah. certain characters. But you, you're the one that said, take the we, fat we, man we, down. We, because, because, you know, the a villain of that strength becomes, in my mind at least, it was he was, he wasn't becoming more strong because Daredevil never took him down. It was just making Daredevil weaker because you can't keep threatening yeah. that without doing something about it he so that bark and no bite yeah and so that was the real heart of it and i said we got it we've got to do this and 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 there were some other things baked in there um but that was the real probably uh, hook and you know ralph calls me up or whatever you know and says you're it and it was like oh my god <laughs> and you got daredevil what are you doing Dunzilla, Dunzilla, you had you had 300 before i did Yep. What were your thoughts on it when you bought it? Because you've you've told me all the time how great 300 was, and it is a great book. Yeah. I have it in yeah. my in my collection. But what did 300 mean to you? Uh, it was it was the story where Daredevil finally takes him down. I mean, this was one of the the first Daredevil stories I ever read, and yeah. it was uh, it was actually a four part series. But obviously, all the good stuff was in you know the majority of the good stuff was in part four where. Kingpin finally gets beaten by Daredevil. And I think, um, if I'm mistaken. Uh, I'm listening, Dunn Baby. I think Dan's mic came, unlo- came unglued. Oh, that's okay. Um, I lost my train of thought. Now. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I'm working on it. Uh, any better? Nothing? Well, I can hear you clear as day, yeah, No words. Hear. Yep, we can hear you. Clear you as day. can hear me, but I can't hear you. You can't hear us. Yeah, we... I can't hear a word you guys are nope. saying. Um, Uh-oh. Should I jump out and jump back in? How about now? That was weird. It's like all of a sudden it just went blank. And and Matt, you were telling a great story, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> that's strange. Can I jump out and re- and and come back on? You should. Maybe that'll reset it. All right, let me do yeah. that. I'll be right back. So yeah, we're joined tonight by Dan Chai Chester, and uh, we're having a little. little te- he's having a little technical, technical difficulties, difficulties on his microphone. <laughs> Delighted that he's here with us, talking a little Daredevil, talking a little Nick Fury, talk a little James Bond and horror. Before he comes back, I just want to say that this show was brought to you by Tasty at Tuesdays for all her tasty, tasty 
dishes. Check out Tasty with Tuesday's Facebook page and check out the Bad for Your Health Entertainment page. She's the best. God bless her. She's the man. Dan's coming back. Done. Come back with the spawn. Uh, the spawn, Jesus. Daredevil 300 <laughs> story. That was strange, it's guys. It's a great sorry book, about Glenn, You're in the middle now, bud. I know. Oh, that's the man. place he belongs. So I, I'm sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Anyway, <laughs> that's you're, okay. you're going to tell me how you, you yeah, picked up Daredevil 300. How was it? Yep. Uh, it's one of my favorite Daredevil stories. Um, like I was saying earlier, it's it's one of the first Daredevil stories I ever read. Okay. And it was a, it was a four part series. Yep. Last rights. Uh, last rights. Yep. And it was it's basically Daredevil wanting to just finally take out Kingpin. Um, I reread it uh, this morning, and I think uh, Daredevil kind of describes Kingpin as like a like a crime boss who's trying to lord over you know all the subjects in New York mm -hmm. like like a king. And he's like, all right, no more of this. And uh, and I think Kingpin wanted to frame Daredevil for a murder or something like that, just to kind of get him finally get the thorn out of his side. Well, yeah, that was something I picked up from, um, you know, from Frank Miller's um, awesome Born Again story, you know, great which story. is that they're yeah. the beyond great. And um, and certainly we were trying to, you know, we echoed a few a few of those things. But in that book, um, you know, the Kingpin had left open the opportunity to frame Matt Murdock. You know, for murder, he had held yeah. on to these, you know, uh, you know, the, these blood evidence, you know, in essence, you know, the billy clubs, you know, that had been used not by by the kingpin or the kingpin's henchmen to to murder a cab driver. Yep. And and uh, and and then, you know, put uh, Matt's uh, handprints on them or Matt's blood on them. But they were tainted with evidence that would have marked, you know, Matt for for murder. And, uh, and that was a little kind of a tease in that story that was ominous, but wasn't really picked up on. So, you know, we said in this story to, to kind of complete the echo in a way, you know, can we play that out? And, um, and it became this great bit where that was something that we could, we could bring forward as the Kingpin had hidden these things away for a rainy day. Mm -hmm. um, but instead it became, you know, just a, very terrible bad day for the kingpin <laughs> instead yeah what i always was... liked was that after the kingpin tombstone tried to take over yes yeah. was... <laughs> because i always thought tombstone was one of the most underused characters i mean he was, he was sort character. of like a spider-man sea villain who what debuted in web of spider-man mm -hmm. he he had like a few big hits but then i'm like and dead man's walking and i uh, dead man's hand i just i never i I wasn't reading Nomad, so I didn't get the whole gist. I kind of just read what Daredevil. Right, right. That was always the trick with those kind of crossovers where do you get into everybody involved or are you just zoomed in on the character you like the most? And Marvel does that all the time now. And I, I, I'm out of the loop with the modern Marvel. But mm -hmm. I remember about 10 years ago, they did that with Deadpool and Thunderbolts. And I was like, I am not reading Thunderbolts just to read this <laughs> just, story. Just read Deadpool. Deadpool story. Yeah. They do too many uh, crossovers. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it can it can get it can get bewildering. I was talking to somebody the other day, and and uh, I was talking about something. I was really it was Batman Metal. I was really looking forward to it. It's just great reviews, yeah. and and uh, mm -hmm. and it looked really wild with all these different Batman and Joker types. And and I, no discredit to the creative team, but I couldn't get into it. I just it was it, it started great metal. My and. Dunn and I usually have the same take taste in comics, but metal is one of the few things that we disagree on. Yeah, Dunn, I know your take on metal. You you don't love it, but you like it. I don't. I, I liked it. I thought it was a cool, like you know, apocalyptic future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Movie. That part was awesome. I just couldn't. But then it was just. It, was, it it definitely wasn't great. No, you know, it by, it could have by been no means better. I called that story great. It could have been a lot better, you know, in my opinion. It could have been a lot more like organized. It. That was like it. it felt, yeah, it felt a little disorganized to me. But no, that's... it was. It was. It's hard because there was a lot of like time travel involved. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Tom, you know, Marvel has the clones, and yeah. DC has the time travel. The, the, yeah, yeah, and DC's got time travel and multiverse. So it was, it was, it was kind of hard to keep track of what was going on because everything was just all over the place. All over. Yeah, that happens. And then, of it course, happens. you know, they bring in the tie-ins. You know, the three hundred other tie-ins that you have to read just to read the whole story. Yeah, and, and I, that's I, when I tuned out. 
I yeah. mean, I've been been guilty of it myself. So I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna. I, some, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it is, you know, you you have to, you, you never know what goes on behind the scenes, right? You know, yeah. is a is a is a creative team going off the deep end, or did the editorial office come in and say you've got to include these six, five characters? And you don't have any choice in the matter. And then suddenly and that was my question. Like you brought no man Punisher. And was that something that was like, you must do this? Or were you just kind of like, Hey, let's use nomad. Well, you know, the funny thing with that one was we, we, who did I work on with that? That was Fabian and, um, and, um, Chuck Dixon, right. I think we're the Chuck other writers, D. you know, and <laughs> so we had gone to the promotions group where the promotions group came to us and said, we, if we, if we, bring these characters together in a storyline, we'll get more, we'll get more spotlights on your books. So um, that was appealing to us, <laughs> as you might imagine, you know, okay, we want, we want some more PR on these titles that we're working on. So we, we agreed to that, but because Chuck and Fabian and I all got along, you know, we pretty much went out to a long lunch and like hashed that story out, you know, for, for good, bad or indifferent you know, that was us, right? That was us yeah. sort of saying, okay, yeah, we can do this. And it'll be good for the attention on the titles because the PR department will do more with it. Um, but we figured out that story, you know, we, which was cool, right? That's the best way to do it. You weren't sort of in a room with a bunch of people that you maybe don't know. And you're trying to like scratch your head and figure out how do you make this um, convoluted uh, story by committee we just and basically it's that awkward off tent, you don't want to step on someone's toes yeah. and say, well, your character shouldn't really right or yeah. Or, you, you know guys what were doing. all tight. We were tight and we were like, we're just riffing, saying, let's go to Vegas, let's do this, let's do that. And everybody was pretty agreeable. And and you know, we finished the lunch, we had the beats, and we knew, okay, I'm gonna pass the baton to you. I'm gonna pick the baton up from you. And and it was pretty easy pleasy actually <laughs> that is a nuts story like that story is just nuts the whole vegas and then tombstone yeah <laughs> and, and there was a story i would do you know years later not years later a couple years later uh, you know that was the same thing it was with the character terror and um and silver that was Stable. my next question i was actually gonna bring up terror <laughs> yeah and 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 um and luke cage and it was the same thing me and mark mclaurin and greg wright uh went out to lunch and we basically hashed the story out with our three characters and said our three characters and and uh and you know it was an easy way to kind of make a make a big omnibus story happen now was it around this time that you did the wolverine two-parter as well um well that would have been i can't remember the exact timing because it would have been a little bit after when terror incorporated launched yeah. Um, so it was just shortly after that, right? Because it was still early in that book launching, and um, and uh, and so my suggestion to bring that character into that story was to try to get more attention on that character. And Terror is just a visually striking character with the. Just... Oh yeah, and he's just bizarre. I mean, to this day, I I have no idea how anybody let us get away with what that character did or represent it i i'm glad they did but it's just doesn't you know it just doesn't make sense i mean you're letting us come up with a character that tears off people's body yeah, parts take, take me into that like because that they went what like 13 or 14 issues 13 issues 13 issues and it's the whole i have not read it in a long time but i just remember when i read it i was just like whoa hey now <laughs> so this, this, guy, this guy went from cool to what's he smoking um, well, Terror was a strange character because he started off as a character called Shrek before there was a yes. big, you know, green zombie, you know, or not zombie, but um, ogre um, in, a, in, a, in a line of books called the Shadow Line, which was a, a group of superheroes that were created for that epic imprint. And uh, and and Shrek was this character was an assassin. He was a mercenary for hire. And, uh, and he was the main foil of one of the, the, the superheroes in that universe, a superhero called St. George, essentially. And, um, and he had the, basically the exact same powers, the exact same things, you know, the same look created by Klaus Janssen. And when those books went away, it was like, okay, he was a great character. We're not going to see him again. But then uh, there was this moment in time where I got this call from Carl Potts 
uh, who was one of the, the, the editors in chief of Marvel when they had several editors in chiefs. And he said, we're thinking of doing something with the Marvel horror comics. We want to kind of create a universe for them. And we're thinking this Shrek guy could sort of be, I don't know, like maybe the crypt keeper of these stories or something, you know, he's got, a, he's got a visual look. Oh he's yeah. Got a, he's got a, he's got a routine. Maybe he could somehow, you know, draw in werewolf by night, you know, tomb of Dracula. And yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> this terror he's, in a nutshell. he's, he's a, he's a, he's a character. Um, and, uh, and I said, hey, that's weird, and that's cool. So we lift him out of that Shadowline universe, and we drop him over here into Marvel. And, well, why don't we call him Terror? Because that's what Shrek means. It's the German word for terror. Yep. And, uh, and you know, we'll still be a mercenary, and we'll do this. And we started to kind of get going on that. And then they were like, no, 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 no. We don't want to do that anymore, which happens, right? But he debuted in Daredevil. You brought him into Daredevil first, right, with the Surgeon General storyline? Um, I know, I think he was, his book was probably, uh, off and running by that point, but, okay. um, I think, but, but we, because what happened, even though they decided not to do the, the, you know, the, uh, the horror universe thing, they said, well, you're kind of already started to do this work. Why don't we just make him a, his, give him his own book? And I was like, okay, <laughs> like, what am I going to do? Argue with that? And, uh, and they were, um, so that's where he became this more mercenary, you know, for higher character. And then he fell under this, this umbrella of what they call the big guns, right? There were four or five titles that were all pretty much mercenary like characters like Silver Sable, Luke Cage. I think they threw the Punisher in there. There was yep. a Brit, there was a Brit title in there. Um, and, and, uh, and they gave us license to run with it. And, and, but it was, they never acknowledged that it was the same character. And in fact, Mark McLaurin would continue to insist um, almost to this day that no, 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 they weren't the same character, but, you know, cause we never did like a, a universe to universe bridge, but yeah, he's basically the same character. I mean, you can't, <laughs> you, you can't get away from like, he's, he's rather unique in the, in the combination of, of characters and what he does. But it only, sadly, it only lasted a year ish. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, maybe it wasn't the right fit. Um, uh, but I, I, I will probably get more um, comments about that to this day than than many things because he was so strange and weird and unique. It was and, just so different, and it was just the visuals. Just and you're right, it was just awesome. Oh, it was it was con stream of consciousness stuff. Writing that guy. I, I mean, I remember talking to Carl Poss at one point when I was a little frustrated that they were going to cancel the title and. And, uh, and I was saying, well, you know what? I'm just going to take this character idea and I'm going to go somewhere else with it. And he laughed at me and he said, well, your problem is you came up with a character that was so unique. You can't take him anywhere else because they're going to know right away. <laughs> they're going to know character. who he is. Right. It's not like, oh, here's the big strong guy and you're going to go do a big strong guy over here. Or here's the fast guy. And you're going to do a fast guy over here. How many other characters have been developed that have the ability to pull off somebody else's, you know, arm or limb or. And attach it to themselves and then get all the emotional components of that and skills of that character i i, I love what he does in the wolverine book where wolverine gets that uh he gets impaled and he, he's got to throw him in a frozen <laughs> pond in like northwest oregon i i reread that this morning and i was just like yeah wolverine man, was so just like the, the two of them were so much fun to put together it was, it oh, was i'm like, sure they were and yeah jubilee there almost as like a that 90s sidekick voice of yeah. reason just kind of yeah. like well here we go you know <laughs> and Derek's art was just off the charts great I mean just really really terrific and you know you asked before before we started the show and I was saying it was it, you know this the, the story of getting that wasn't that dramatic in the sense of of Larry was doing a ton of things you know at that time and and basically they you know he needed some time to get ahead you know so the editorial office um you know, checked in with me. Are you available? Right. And that's because again, you know, certain people and you, you're traveling in like certain like circles. I was doing good work on one title where it gets back to the X office. The X office is like, Hey, we need somebody to, to kind of basically help Larry get ahead. You know, can you pick up these, these couple, three issues? And, um, and then that's it. And then you work the story out with them, you know, and I suggested, Hey, could I bring this character into it? And they were sure. 
you know, let's see what you can do with it. Um, so it becomes a bit of a showpiece for, you know, for terror as much as a, a Wolverine adventure. Yeah, I always that would that could have been a good Marvel team up book because you really didn't have a spotlight yeah. on either one. It was, I mean, granted, it was Wolverine's title, but it was like this was a great showcase for terror to, yeah. you know, to get over with the, the fans. And like you had said earlier, to get some attention from the X fans to maybe check out terror. Right, right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Although it's a little strange for the X fans cup of tea, but we made it work. <laughs> well, you know how X-Men fans are, it's, especially in that era. <laughs> well, you know, you had, all, you, had, you, had, you had all different degrees, as, as I'm sure you do today. Different layers to all the, the facets That's of true. Marvel. Exactly. When, after, when you were doing Daredevil, and we're not going to go all night talking here, but I, I wanted to ask specifically how when you did Last Rites and then sort of, I don't want to call it the goofy ones, but like, you know, 317 and 318 when, you know, still they were man goofy. and task. They were very you goofy. Know. You can call them Tom. They were very, very <laughs> they were, goofy. They were, they were the comic ones, but like, they, was Fall from Grace, because that was really, in from my perspective, a, correct me if I'm wrong, and I may be wrong on this, that was almost a career defining story for you. Um, I, I think between that and, um, and last mm -hmm. rights, you know, certainly. I mean, you know, those, yes, those two, one A and one B. Yeah, big, mm -hmm. you know, big, big spotlights and big moments, you know, in time for different reasons. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, 300, you know, getting up to 300, fall the, you know, bring the kingpin down. Those are, uh, those are, are very much in line with um, almost inevitable things, you know, that, that sort of feel like they have to happen in the Daredevil universe or whatever. Um, Fall from Grace came out of a team effort, uh, you know, wanting to basically save Daredevil and not that Daredevil was, you know, at risk of, of anything necessarily. But at that point in time, all the attention is on mutants. Yep. All the attention is on spiders yep. uh, and, you know, not to take any attention away from them because, you know, great titles and great characters. But we're over here waving our hands, sort of saying, hey, we got a great character over here. Um, why not give us a little bit of love? And, and was Daredevil still viewed as, I don't want to say the poor man Spider-Man, but like a B-plus character? I would say so. And I don't think anyone wanted to pay any attention to Daredevil unless Frank Miller was writing it. From And, and you know, when Frank Miller wrote Daredevil, it was great. I'm not, yeah. There's no, that, that's not the question. But at one point, the, you know, when, um, when, uh, um, was it Daredevil Year One? Might have been Daredevil Year One. You know that the 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 story that he did with Mazzucchelli, David Mazzucchelli, and uh, and it was like the first year of of Daredevil, like Matt Murdock being Daredevil. And the ad that the internal group came up with was "It's Miller time," yep, right? I remember you know, that. Like they, they lifted uh -huh. the they lifted the the beer ad, you know, which. <laughs> and I remember saying to them, I said, "This is really bad form." Because what you're saying is that your character, what you own, you know, what Marvel owns as a character, right? They own the character, is only relevant when Frank Miller writes it. So I'm not trying to like pat myself on the back or Scott on the back or anything like this, but that that's the signal that you're send, sending when you put an ad out like this, right? Everything else about this character doesn't matter unless it's Frank Miller. And mm -hmm. again, granted, Frank Miller's doing amazing work. Um, and and so we were looking at that situation and we said, we've got to do something that, you know, really draws attention to Daredevil. And some of that was thinking about, I'll call them manufactured things, right? We have to think about things that are going to get attention overtly, like a, a costume, right? Costume change or something like that. That's one thing. But then that we have your to idea. Um, well, it was one of the ideas, you know, I mean, you, you know, I'll, I mean, I'll take credit, blame, whatever for it. I mean, credit. we, you know, we, we, we thought about it, uh, what to do with it and, and other things like, how do you start to, you know, guest stars, right? Do you put guest stars in a book, but how do you make it work? Right. How do you do it where it doesn't start to feel like it's, oh, we're just plugging this person in here. And then, um, and so, you know, this was a lot of talk in that editorial office. You know, Ralph Macchio, Pat Garrahy was the assistant editor. Scott was on the book, but looking, you know, looking at his own work and saying, I want to do something different, right? You know, because Scott's art style changes. Drastically. Right? Overnight, almost, you know, yes. from, from, from one to the next. He goes from sort of like a 
I'll, I'll even so sort of like almost like a bar, Mark Bagley like influenced artist. It, it kind of goes like a little Bagley like in the early three uh, three tens, the three teens, and then it almost looks like a storyboard from Blade Runner. Yeah, and then he goes you know into this whole you know thing and continue to discover himself. But that was you know a team, and you know Scott and I were 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 driving a lot of that. But there was definitely deep conversations with 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 Pat with Ralph. What do we do? What can we use? How do we create a story that's going to get people's attention on this book? And that worked from that first cover, you know, that 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 uh, Empire State Building, and you know, what the heck is going on here? You know, <laughs> the starkness of that thing to um, uh, you know to continuing, you know, through you know through to the conclusion. <laughs> Gotta be there somewhere. I got it in here in my stack somewhere. If I don't, I'll share it. You know, out of all the books I grabbed. <laughs> That's the one. There you got quite a few. <laughs> That's the one missing, but never fear. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Except he's missing him. He's not there, right? Yeah, he's not there, which it was to me, I was like, hey, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> But um, but yeah, definitely, definitely um, uh, defining and and uh, and uh, satisfying, you know, to, to do something that you know felt felt good in the moment, and then you know here we are many years later, and, and people, you know, are coming out and sort of saying it was it was a good story for them. It was a great story. One, it was one of my top three favorite Daredevil stories. The costume change made sense for the time. Thank you. And I've Good. got an armored daredevil over there. So. I got I got the newest one. Did you see the newest one? It's like, I've got I the have original. not seen the newest one. I I, I almost bought the new one that the that the Spider Man that came out with the Spider Man. I got toy. the original one, and then I just picked up the um. Which way do I go? You know this yeah, one. That was like that's so it. So accurate, nice. but the original one is like so cheesy. But it's um. It's also like uh, that tall. Yeah, exactly. It's like one of the old <laughs> like yeah, real mini mini ones. But it's but it's fun. You know, and it was cool because, uh, you know, the only time I remember seeing Daredevil in a black suit before that was that that little Hulk movie he did. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Those, those, um, you know, I, I will always be a big fan of Armored Daredevil. Yeah. Well, you see, it's funny. It's like the, the the thing is, we never called it Armored Daredevil, and and I realized after the fact, um, the re, you know, the only the problem with the costume was the only person who could draw the costume basically was Scott. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah, and you had other guys that tried. I, yeah. I mean, I think Keith Pollard did good on his little run with you uh, right. towards the end of your run on Daredevil. But, but I really think that's a, that's pure Scott McDaniel. It, it is. And, and, and when Scott did it, it felt what it was supposed to be, which was, you know, these special materials that are closely bonded to his body, that are providing more protection, and but 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 very lithe and very um, uh, you know in line with his motions and bodies. It was never supposed to be a bulky thing. Yeah. And Scott got that because he created it. And then unfortunately, other artists would kind of come in and say, "Oh, it's armor." Oh, and and they bulked it up, right? They bulked it up to the point where, you know, it it suddenly looked like it had rivets and and bolts and, and such in it and uh yeah and 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 that's where it it lost its sort of magic you know a bit and then of course it, it went away pretty quickly after that try to find a good picture of what you would just described how it, it, would, it became bulky it looked like something cable would wear oh yeah in fact uh, the last yeah exactly yeah it becomes yep. becomes very chunked yeah, up yep. and then um yep. we actually did a the last issue of Daredevil I ever did, which was 380, which was the last issue of the first volume. And they asked me and Lee Weeks to kind of come back. There's actually, we did a gag in there where it was actually, you know, uh, people misremembering, you know, like an incident with Daredevil. And there's a scene where there's a literally a, a Tony Stark designed. Yeah. You know, you know it's funny. I, 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 I never, I've read the book once, but I never bought it. I saw it on, a, not a spinner rack. I saw it back in the day and I was going to buy it. I put it down, forgot about it. And all these years later, I have never, sadly, I've never read Daredevil 380. 
Oh, really? I'll see if yes. I, I'll find. I don't know if I have a copy, but I'll see if I if I do. Tom, I'll I will uh, I will gladly send you one. But I will see hey, if cool. I have one. Um, and then, but that was you know I know it's I think the title of this is just a good story, right? Because they were prepping the Kevin Smith. Yeah, it's just it's it was just 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 one good story is the title of it. And it's actually that was a it's um I think actually Joe. It was does Kevin Smith do it with Joe Casada? Is that who? Yeah. Who, is that okay? So yeah, so that was. Yep. That's who took uh, it Guardian over. Devil and then the death of Karen Page and yep. just just you know that's a good run but like that was when when I started picking that up I was just like I don't know like Daredevil Volume Two is weird I I don't follow Daredevil now sadly I believe Elect Dom who's didn't you tell me Electra is Daredevil Yeah that looks like that's yeah. what's going on right But they're on like yeah, volume, where are they at Matt like four Volume Four or Volume Three at this point because it renumbered oh. itself didn't it. I think, I think they're, they're at, at like volume, volume six. Oh, <laughs> oh really? Oh, yeah. wow. Marvel yeah, has a habit uh, of redoing. Sorry, Don. Go ahead. Yeah, recently, I mean, I don't. I haven't read their uh, uh, ongoing Daredevil series in about five years now. But oh, okay. I have read that uh, Elektra is now Daredevil because I guess Matt Murdock is in prison or something. I didn't really read too much into it, but Elektra is Daredevil now. Yeah, I saw some of the covers and um, and thought they looked pretty cool. But then I noticed the numbering was like twenty three or twenty five, so I figured they had to have relaunched it at some point. So. Yeah, Mar Mar Marvel has a habit of relaunching every title almost every year. Oh, okay. So I've missed uh, I've missed out on that. <laughs> no, really. I've tuned out. I don't read any Martin Marvel now. Sadly, I, it just oh. I, I just got into the uh, Immortal oh. Hulk. Have you guys read that? I did read Immortal Hulk in the beginning, oh. and I thought it was like, wow, this is like a really unique take to take yeah. the Hulk into horror, which is easy to do, but no one ever really did it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I, I ripped through those, um, at least, you know, a, a bunch of those collections uh, and really enjoyed that. I thought yeah, that Al was... Ewing killed it on the first part, but then around issue 10 or 12, I kind of yeah, started to go out. little, yeah. little, what, why for you? It just too weird or too, because it definitely got into the whole hell and yeah. You know, once Hulk went back into hell, like I was cool with Hulk fighting Sasquatch, but I was just like, when he's going into hell and mm. banner and cause you know, banners head is in like 9,000 different places <laughs> at once. So he's almost like moon Knight with his split personalities exactly. and devil hulks and gray hulks and, <laughs> Yeah, there are the green hulks. I was just sort of like, I think I need a break. <laughs> after, a while, after a while, it becomes too much. It's yeah. Again, it's sort of like it gets yeah. it gets lost in its own continuity. But I yeah. did enjoy I took, it. I took a big break from modern comics a couple of years ago, where I was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna. They'll Get be here when I come back. Yeah, yeah, they will be. They will be. And there's lots of there's so much stuff out there. It's crazy. Yep. You know, how, and and a lot of it is 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 just great. I mean, you you don't you wouldn't notice it if you're all you're focused on is the big continuities. But um, I mean, I'm late to the party on like Sweet Tooth. I thought that was like terrific. If you guys haven't seen Sweet that, Sweet Tooth is pretty good. Yeah, I mean, that was just like to me, it was like, man, this is awesome. Like end of the world, weird biologies, um, taught stuff, um, and so to me, it's all. You know, it's refreshing sometimes when you come into it a little bit late in the game because then you can binge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything no, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's why I still love looking at old Marvel titles, Marvel Volume Ones. It's like, okay, if I get issue fifty nine of something, yeah, well, if I dig this, I can go find one through fifty eight. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I'm still guilty. I, I one of the books that I have not, I have not, I have not stopped reading was Spawn because '90s kid at heart. Well, but it's also like you when when creators have that kind of vision and that ability to continue to produce, there's got to be a reason for it, right? Beyond ego, there's real story and and something they're drawing from. Another one that's like that is Savage Dragon, right? If you if you've ever read that, and I mean Eric Larson, just like you know, I mean I dismissed that book you know, in my head early on, like, oh, okay, it's like a kind Me of a, a sort of a thing. What is it, like two, 250 issues, 300 yeah, issues? They, I'll give Larson credit on that. He's, yeah. he's he's killing it. He loves it. He's and doing he's it. And he's going through different weird genres and, you know, approaches. Yeah, that right. and every, yeah, that's understating it, right? Yeah. But that's, that's um, a creator's vision, and that 
means there's things there to mine, you know, for umpteen years uh, and and continue to find an audience and continue to to make something out of things. So uh, I'm I'm big fans of that type of approach. I, I I'll tell you one thing and done. You got to tell him Scout. Scout Comics is his his baby now, and I'm loving Alterna. If you, yep. oh really? Newsprint. Okay. Yep. Go check that. Alterna, out. It, yep. they're cheap. They're on. Oh man, I cannot say I cannot sing their praises enough. They're cool. They're and they're on the old newsprint. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing I like about Scout Comics is they have like a they have like a an entirely like different publishing for their horror stories. Like there's there's like twelve, 12 or, different store horror go, uh, horror stories going out right now. Okay. With Scout Comics, they're, they're okay. really cool. Oh, I'll definitely check that out. Right up my and I'll tell you a series that was messed up, but it was funny as hell, but not in a comedic way. From a, from a story standpoint, Vampire State Building. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, that was a Blaze Comics. That was a Blaze comic, but boy, I'll tell you, that was just. The All concept right. stuck in the Empire State Building with a bunch of vampires. A bunch oh, of yeah. vampires. That was great. That was awesome. <laughs> you got to get. actually one of the uh, original creators of The Walking Dead. Um, Which that's one? Right. Not Kirk. Uh, it was yep. uh, Charlie Adler. Oh, Charlie. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All I think right. I think he he was. Uh, I think he created it. I'm pretty sure. I haven't read it in a while. He did, but... and that's just a nuts yeah. story. That's just, Walking Dead. I mean, come on. Yeah, I mean, he almost made it to 200 before he just decided to pull the plug. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's um... Dan, before we before we part ways, though, do you do you look back at your days at Marvel with fond memories? I, I know you're not big in the industry today, if at all, but I mean, absolutely. I mean, it was it was um, you know, like you said, it was some things were just defining in terms of you know, being able to work as a, as a writer, to be able to work with great people. I mean, we've touched on, you know, a couple really important things, but I mean, I worked with some just incredibly talented people and learned, you know, from them and got to take um, the things that, you know, we talked about me growing up with and suddenly, you know, I'm playing in this, in this sandbox and some people wanted that their whole lives, right? That was the thing they always wanted. Um, and, you know, for me, it was just a, an amazing, unexpected surprise. Uh, and then being able to, uh, you know, to build on that. And, and even though I haven't continued to work in comics in that way, I'm actually working on something now that will come to life uh, in, a, in a bit of time. But care to share? Can you try? Uh, can you try? Can you give Bad for Your Health an exclusive? I <laughs> I can tell you it's with uh, artist Carl Waller, who I worked with on a book called Motorhead at Dark Horse Comics many many years ago. And um, that was in Dark Horse. Pres no, 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 that was limited. That was a six it was part, it yeah. was their it was their um it was their universe, and uh, and so Carl and I became good collaborators and and good friends, and uh, and it was um and it's a I'll say right now it's it's got multiple dimensions. It's got a horror um, aspect to it. Actually, it was described to me by somebody I let read uh, the first couple of issues. Uh, it's like uh, the good place meets from dusk till dawn. So I don't know what that All means. Right? Okay. <laughs> but I okay. like that description. Um, I'm in. And um, but you know everything I learned at Marvel. Right. And everything I learned doing those comics at that time, you know, is stuff I continue to, to draw from today. Right. You, 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 you learn to tell a story, you learn to collaborate with people, you learn to find the humanity, right. In the things that you're, you're doing. Um, and that's a big change, right. When I said earlier on, when I was drawn maybe to the, some of the DC work when I was a kid and I was really plot driven, right. I've certainly still think about, plots and stories now but i'm much as as much focused if not more focused on the why you know of a character and what is what are they doing and what's the the humanness in them which is we uh, got to get behind the character the lead to, to get to the story because if we can't believe in the lead what's the point of the story right right and that's you know you you held up that um that last page of fall from grace earlier right that was all about who Matt Murdock was as a character to my mind. Yes. 
who Daredevil was as a character to my mm -hmm. mind. That I was, still put this as a top three Daredevil image in all the Daredevil images I've ever seen. <laughs> I um, but that's you know that's that doesn't work unless you, as a writer, believe in it, right? It doesn't come across the audience, and and I thank you guys for having it come across to you. I mean, being so receptive to it. Oh, I'll I'll sing "Fall from Grace's Praise." Last rites, tree of knowledge. Yep. We didn't get into tree of knowledge. Maybe we can save that for a part two. That would be great. I love tree of knowledge. I, I tree of knowledge. Right. I gotta ask one question about tree of knowledge before we go, though. Yeah. I gotta ask. Why was there an interlude? Was there always a plan for an interlude? <laughs> no, um, there wasn't. And why was there an interlude? You know, um, where did that come in? The thing was, Scott and I were starting up on the Electra book at that That's time oh, yeah. the electro what would be the electro limited series and um and there was a hiccup in the schedule and i think that's why we you know we had to introduce that like in order to kind of like keep everything going but it wasn't it wasn't planned you know so it was it was a way to sort of keep and because we were bringing in you know some talent that um that we were familiar with and we knew we'd keep things going in our direction Right, because I think Greg Greg worked on that. Greg Wright, um, it, it had allowed that, us. Greg had that great run on Silver Sable. And oh yeah, Morbius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was just that it wasn't planned, but it was necessary, I guess. Gotcha. <laughs> you know? A bump in the road. A bump in the road to kind of to kind of get there. Well, thank I that that's something that I always wondered after all these years. Why yep. was there a tree of knowledge interlude? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was it. It was just it was it was just a scheduling gaffe of where we were and having to having to keep on track and and get get some of the get some of the electro stuff going, I'm pretty sure. Before we part ways, what are you up to? What what is there anything that you're watching streaming? What what are you looking at creatively that that's just wowing you on anything, whether it's a book, comic, movie, television? Um, wow. Um, there is so much good stuff out there nowadays, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's almost, you know, too much. Um, it's mind numbing. It's information overload. Yeah. And you, you, you miss out on, on a thousand things for every choice you have. Um, anything that jumps to mind right now is, you know, we talked about, it, I think before the show started, I, I love that uncut gems movie. You know, I just saw not a happy movie, but a completely raw, uh, city piece, which, uh, you know, really, you know, struck me uh, really well. Uh, I thought that was just, uh, you know, dynamite. There's a book I just read called making comics, um, which is by a woman named Linda Barry. And it is, it is just one of the best books on creativity and encouraging you to draw and sketch no matter what you do. It's not like literally about making a comic book, but it is about thinking from the drawing out, if you will. And uh, I think that's just a, one of the uh, most inspiring books uh, I've seen, you know, in quite a while. And, um, uh, you know, those two jump to mind, you know, right now, not uh, uh, I'm always looking for something, you know, new to, to kind of get me going. So I'll report back next time with a better list. Excellent. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it greatly. Dunzilla, yeah, yeah. You got anything you got to you want to add before we, we kick butt? No, just want to say uh, thanks for joining us. Hope we can uh, have you on the show again. I'd love it. I'd love it, guys. This has been terrific. Really fun way to spend the start of a Sunday evening. Uh, both of you stay well, and I'll keep uh, watching and see what's going on with you guys. And definitely hit me up again. Be happy to, to come back around. Excellent. Thank Excellent. you very much. For Dan right. Chester, Donzilla, I'm Tom. Once again, the show is brought to you by Tasty with Tuesday. Check out all her page. Uh, check out all her tasty dishes on Tasty with Tuesday's Facebook page. And a lot of them I share on Bad for Your Health Entertainment. And also by my main man, Peter Schreff, over at Out of This World Jewelry. I'm Tom, Donzilla, for Dan Chester. Thank you. Good night. We'll see you next week. Take care, guys. Bye. You too.